I'd start by saying, um, I'd ask you that there's a challenge, I'd ask the question. Um, we have talked a lot in the few days I've been here, and we've talked a lot about evidence. And the question about this, uh, this kind of rhetoric around we believe in evidence is, that is, that's an easy thing to say. It's a really difficult thing to honor. It's going to be a really serious change for the system if you're true about that and if you're sure about that. I worry because it's become uh, my passion now to really be involved in the creation and spread and making evidence available to teachers that we might skate over the hard work and go into the really great presentation we just had, um, default back to our own behaviors, but we've just done it. We've done evidence. It's a really, e it's a really one. So I'm going to challenge you about how committed are you to this question. So the framework, and I don't really need to talk too much about you. I've only got 19 minutes anyway, but I don't want to talk too much about uh, the kind of theory of change because you've seen a kind of framework for change. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the question now back to Susie is, are you going to evaluate that? Are you going to test that works? Is that part of our honoring of evidence that we actually take those things to that step as well? It's not what we say, it's what we all do. Is it in all of our, our obligations now that we're going to we're going to be able to answer the question when somebody asks me, as, uh, as Stephen said, on, on, on our table, how do you know? How do you know? How do all of us know that the things that we say to people are the right thing to say and are valuable for them to, to say to them? And in the end, when you're moving bright spots to bright systems, I guess what I wanted to reflect back to you is that is going to be hard. You know, my 30-odd years in education of trying to improve schools is, and I said it last night to people, you know, it's not glamorous. It's hard work. And being up for the hard work day in, day out, it's sleeves rolled up time, really, if we're going to do this. And it's going to be hard. And not only is it going to be hard because it is hard, it's going to be hard because what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and confront power. You're going to try and move resources. You're going to try and change people's decisions. And that is difficult. And with a small p, and a word we all hate in education, but we have to face up to, it is a political act. And to that, I wanted to start with a, a, a short point. Earlier this year, um, in England, someone that, um, one of the politicians in England who could speak to people right across, you may not have agreed with him, where, but Tony Benn spoke to people right across England. And uh, people used to pay to go and hear him, for goodness sake, as a politician, that's interesting. And he'd fill, he'd fill, he'd fill cinemas and, and, and places like that where people heard him speak. And he used to say, when you're talking to power, and this is what teachers need to think about, and I'm going to translate this to education in a moment. When you're talking to power in a democracy, and you're trying to change things, you can ask everybody five questions. Uh, and it, it, to ask if it's truly democratic. What power have you got in the system? What, what's your power? Where did you get that power from? In whose interest do you use your power? To whom are you accountable? And if I don't like you, can I get rid of you? Five quite good questions to ask of people who want to exercise power over you. So I want to turn this on its head and say, when we're taking our bright spot, and it, the conversation this morning, the videos... John's school, the, the comments from the young people, you know, from Bilal and Habib and Karina, th these are just amazing stories we're hearing. How do you move it around? Uh, and what we have to do is put our almost our stand in the, in the shoes of those people who are looking up to you as you come with your bright spot. Because that looks like a menace to me rather than a kind of opportunity for some people. And I'm going to pose three questions that they have the right to ask you and three questions that we have to kind of work out how we answer. This, will, this, this is linked to the framework, but it's not in that kind of uh, way. I think it's okay for everyone to say to you in, in education, well, think about, where's your authority? Because in the end, as a teacher, you might be asking yourself the question, who tells me what to do? Who is it that tells me what to do? And that means I need to understand where your authority sits. Now, I'm being tentative now, as I've only been here a few days, but you've got the federal government, you've got the state government, you've got these different people. It seems to me that authority, you've got autonomy, you haven't got autonomy. These, how does power and authority shift around? And for the individual teacher, who am I looking at now? A story for me is that when I was, a, when I was a, 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 an inspector in a local education authority leading on, on literacy and language in north of England, um, you had to, by regulation in that authority, become an Ofsted inspector. Now, this is a a lovely regime that all teachers love in England, which uh, comes into your classroom on a regular basis and gives you feedback on your teaching. And it's a very supportive. Actually, it's an organization that swoops in, judges you, and on the back of it, end of the same week, as a head teacher, you can be sacked. It's literally down to that. 
So, and, and you had to be trained to be an Ofsted inspector at the time, and, and, and I happened to be very young. In fact, I was the youngest inspector trained in England at the time. And I was in a classroom having just watched a lesson from a vest veteran teacher at All Saints School in Ilkley, on the edge of Ilkley Moor. And she had just delivered the most wonderful lesson. And I'm about to give her feedback, thinking, I've got no right to give this, say anything to this veteran experienced teacher and the quality of teaching I've just seen. She was sitting there with her palms sweating, her nervous as hell, because she had now assumed, and quite rightly in a sense, that I had power and I had authority. So when we are talking to people about changing their practice, you have to be very aware and conscious of who has power and where does authority sit. You have to be able to answer that question and work out where you're sitting in those structures if you're really going to disrupt the system and change things. The second question that someone might say to me, going back to the kind of Tony Benn frame, is, okay, I'm trying to work out where your authority is, your importance, I'm going to hear you, or you're not, so I'm going to have to, you're going to have to work much harder to get anything through my door. The second question is, on what basis are you exercising this power? On what basis are you telling me what to do? Do I trust you? Trust in education. For me, after love, the most important word I can think of. It's at the essence of my interaction with a child that they know I care. We heard about that. Teachers that give you a hug in the morning. Teachers that care about you as an individual. This is profound in the relationship for learning. All the way through, of course, to do we trust our teachers. Of course, if we swoop in and inspect them unannounced, what we're implicitly saying in England is, you know what, we don't trust any of you. So how do we build trust? But how do we make that trust assured? How do we make it active? It's not a passive thing. It's not trust me and let me get on with it. It's trust me and I will demonstrate that, I've earned, that, that I'm worthy of your trust. It's a constantly active interaction between two, two, two parties to demonstrate and prove my trust. You'll be there when I need you. You'll be there in the street fight. You'll be there when it, the going gets tough. And I need to sort of see that. I need to be through that fire almost to know that that trust is, is assured. And I think in this, it's in the active and passive domain of trust here. This is important for this conversation. And it reminds me of the first day, uh, again, people heard me talk about the first day when I taught. And it, I can't, it still haunts me. Uh, and the, 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 one, the one bit, and probably the children, but the, 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 the one bit that I remember really well in all of this was... Um, in England, on every given year, there's about 640,000 children start a school on any, any given year in, mid, in September. And there are about 36,000 people who start teaching on the same day. I don't know who's the most nervous, but anyway. And some of those, and on the day, the day that I'm going to talk to you about was the day when the two of us came together. And across the threshold, the parents were giving, to me, the most treasured possession in their life, their children. And the phrase you kept hearing all the time was, Two words, two, two sentences at the end. Do what the teacher says. See you later. I love you. <laughs> Do what the teacher says. How many children come into the classroom with uh, so much that their parents not only have provided this opportunity to teach children, but they've told their children, you should trust this person. And the obligation we have when someone has said to their child, Trust this person. Of course, they regret it later because they come back a few weeks later and say, if my son says once more, Kevin says, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go. And if, when my daughter came home, if I heard once more, Mrs. Mrs. Lake does not run this house. <laughs> so I don't really give her what Mrs. Lake says. In this house, we do. But this is an indication of this, this trust and this power and how it's for children. And at the beginning of school, I guess at the beginning of a reception class or at the beginning of the secondary high, at the beginning of high school, they're coming in full of promise and full of trust and confidence in you. And that's, that ekes away. We lose that. We lose that. But it never, uh, I've, I think overwhelmingly, I see it every day at the first day. Uh, and that's provided not only from the child, but from all, you know, we talk about, and it's quite right, we talk about in, in the eastern uh, part of the world, how much parents um, uh, have a status for teachers. And I actually see that in English schools at the beginning. It's us not maintaining our bit, bit of the bargain that it's lost, but you can keep it and you can, you can earn it. So, but, but, but the bit I want to talk about in terms of evidence is, so we have this trust, we have this intimate relationship with the child. They're ready to do not only what I say, you know, on the first day, who wants to watch paint strike? I'll do it, I'll do it. They're ready to do whatever I ask, and they're ready to go home and confront their parents on the basis of what I've been saying in all sorts of ways. What do I let inside this circle to be part of their education experience? Frankly, in some cases, I'll let anything in. 
Uh, I've come to you, Kevin. We could have spent today probably doing something else. We could have all been designing an educational game that we're going to go and sell on the marketplace into schools. <coughs> it would have been absolutely fine and absolutely legal for us to do that, to pitch, to put all of our, our effort into marketing and get it into schools. Would we have had to prove that it works? Would we have had to prove that it does no harm to children? Would we have had to prove that it helps their learning and helps us as teachers? Absolutely not. As long as I can get you to buy it, I can sell it. Can't do that with a lipstick. I can't do that if I want to design and create a lipstick that someone's going to wear. I have to go through a whole plethora of kind of verification that this does what it says and, it's, and, 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 and it does no harm. And I think this issue of assured trust in schools is we've got this responsibility, we've got this space, how do we guard our children from activities and programs and events that we absolutely are sure about do no harm and actually do the good? And I have to say that when you, and that requires you to do a kind of research, not just for work out whether people like it, not work, work out whether, do you know what, it fits with us, it's actually got to be robust and rigorous. And that's why I do have, and I'm not going to take a step back from it, I do have a preference for controlled studies. I do have a preference for, 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 for wisdom and real wisdom. Uh, and, and I think that's not always the case in education. So, and I think that's, so I'm not saying that because um, I want it to be true. Uh, we can always say things we want to be true. I'm saying that because I'm trying to acknowledge my responsibility in that trust relationship I have with children. It's amazing how many things I go on and see in schools that are flights of fancy, that are fads and fashions. And quite frankly, I feel almost, in terms of my profession, slightly ashamed at some of the, the things we've done that are based on the conversations I have with my mates at the last head teachers conference, or the things that I've just picked up and responded to, because I think that's the latest thing we're doing down the road. Uh, and we've got to get serious about that if we're going to professionalize ourselves and begin. And for two, not only to honor the trust, but to be ready to protect our children from the next harmful thing somebody wants to do from one of those big offices somewhere in a system, a government, or somebody else wants to do to our children, how do we protect them if we don't have that kind of culture and that kind of verification going on all the time? But it's hard. Sometimes it tells you things you don't want to know. Sometimes it tells you things that are counterintuitive, and it takes work to build it, that evidence base, and to uh, really read it in a way that isn't superficial. And the final thing I'd say is that we've got authority. I've talked about trust. I do think there's something in the end about, um, I haven't got a nice word for it, but something about evidence and impact for me in my classroom. The point someone made about um, how, why can't we transfer things because you know what, you don't understand, Kevin, the Warwick, in Warwickshire, the water is different. <laughs> you can't do what you do in London in Warwickshire. You know, that kind of culture, it doesn't translate here. We have to invent it for ourselves. We know that isn't true, but education is a very complex act and set of acts. So we do need to verify that it works in my setting. But it's much better to work from something that has worked somewhere else rather than think we have to invent it for ourselves. So we don't have to invent it for ourselves, but we do have to check it out for ourselves. Evidence can't become the next stick to bash us. It's an enabler. It's a support. So let's not invent things for ourselves. Let's check them out for ourselves. And that checking it out for ourselves is going to be not only, again, that verification that I'm doing the right thing, it's going to be the ongoing motivation that this is meeting the needs of all my children. And I want to finish with Susie's slide on the slope of disadvantage in the, in the final story for me. And that is that when I first started teaching, as people heard me say last night, there were children, there was one particular boy, but there, you know, he wasn't on his own. There was a couple of children who didn't learn to read. I wasn't asking him to build, you know, uh, a, a, a space lab. I wanted him to read Frog and Toad. You know, I, I thought this was a, a possible thing by the time he was seven. And I went to my friend who's the head teacher, who is now one of my closer friends. She was my head teacher at the time. And she'd been a teacher in Tower Hamlets in East End of London. She'd given 40 years of her life to this job. And she'd been a head teacher for about 28 years in that borough, Kathy Phillips. Wonderful, wonderful uh, teacher and, and, and educator. And I said, Kathy, I'm really worried about Trevor. She says, look, Kevin, and this is really interesting from someone like Kathy with all her values. They don't all, they're not all going to get it. Don't beat yourself up. They're not all going to get it. And I think this question of they're not all going to get it 
has allowed us to accept slopes like that. It has allowed us to accept the idea that there are some that won't. And of course, to a degree, Kathy's right. But in England, I can't talk about Australia, it's not one, it's not two, it's far too many. And not only that, it isn't just the same one or two, it depends which school you go to. The point, 45 minutes away, the, 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 the variety, the huge variation in education, that's our challenge, the var variation. Until we're all doing it as well as it can be done, we're failing. Uh, and, and I think this profound issue of particularly those disadvantaged children and their exclusion from this joy of learning and education and its success is, to me, the biggest issue we face in education. And I hope that the work we're doing with evidence, the hope we're doing, if we're honouring evidence and doing it properly, the way we build, so the way, so the way we build this authority, the way we use trust, and the way we think about progress of every child will move us all on together. So brilliant. thank you very brilliant, much. Brilliant. So, so <laughs> Part of the um, untested rubbish um, that many would say is foisted on schools comes from the educational publishing sector. And a lot of it is about how to read. And there's a million, a mountain of stuff out there. I want to go, I, I asked you a bit about this last night, to go to your Tower Hamlets experience. How did you cut through all of that to find the most effective way to teach language to your students in those Tower Hamlet schools? Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. What are you learning about how to change the way teachers approach evidence? And do you go after just helping them go through new workflow processes that use evidence? Or are you actually trying to rewire and help them think differently about what they can know uh, and the methods by which they could be assured of that? Whose job is it to find the great ideas to diffuse? Ooh, fantastic. And while you just do that, add um, an extra. And that is, you are a randomised control trial man, yes? Yep. I want you to say something about what else you admit into that work, because there's plenty of people in this room that have been looking yep. at other ways of gathering evidence. And I also want you to say something about emerging possibilities, so that, in fact, as not evidence, but as at least more than a hunch starts to appear, how do you think about pursuing that work in the interest of the system? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, to, your, to your point about teaching... English to those children who, by the way, 77% who start school speak English as one of the languages they speak, and yet when they're 11 and 16, they outperform the national average for children who speak English as their first language, by quite clearly in that borough in terms of English. The, the, the issue there was to, um, uh, two quite interesting things. First, many of the teachers, because the children didn't speak English as their first language, felt very confident about having permission to instruct they were much more pre prepared than I found in schools where uh, you were teaching English uh, to many kids who came with English, who were more tentative to be direct about the teaching of English itself, so teaching literacy. So I was quite keen and was a national figure in leading uh, separating English out from integrated days in primary curriculums and having a dedicated structure and approach to teaching literacy. Now, that didn't come from a publisher. We grew our own schemes of work. We learn about our children. It's really important for our children, and the evidence for us, and, the, and you'll see this in, in the evidence we present in things like the toolkit, the evidence on something, and, and I know it's going to be tentative, or, or, or I'll be going to care, you've got to be always careful where you use this word in education families, phonics. For us, you know, oh. <laughs> how is something which is just essentially understanding the relationship between 26 graphemes and 44 phonemes, as a discrete bit of knowledge that should be taught and go subterranean, becomes such a ridiculous issue in education. Exactly. But anyway, um, <laughs> that knowledge we knew we had to teach quickly and efficiently for these children. So we did. And we had an approach to it, which we led, which our teachers led across our borough, which we had our own kind of model of doing it. We weren't going to allow people to come sweeping in and written it somewhere else. And we created it together because actually teachers can do that in a weekend on that kind of knowledge. To be honest with you, people have overcomplicated it because it's fantastically commercial to do that. And we taught it. Uh, and then also we, you know, we worked hard on things like the, the, the nature of the text, the text that was in the right for our kids, bringing fam. There's a whole set of, of bits, but we were very... Um, direct. So what I'm saying isn't that we make it up for ourselves, it's that we work it out locally and we're quite 
at that point, robust about looking each other in the eye and saying, we have to be reliable for these children. And I think, in a way, one of the issues about high-needs communities in that sense is you have to have highly reliable education systems. That doesn't mean programmatic necessarily, but it has to be reliable and relentless if you're going to drive up standards for these children. So we were, we were like that, and you probably got the feel for it. Um, Simon's point about... Um, uh, yeah, I think we're, at, in terms of the language, I think we're at the foothills here. I think that, it, you know, I don't think I was the only teacher that walked into a classroom, in a sense, in, in, in 1982, making it up as I was going along. Uh, and I don't think that that has necessarily, that, that there are teachers now that will talk to me um, about effect sizes and da 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 da. We are still right at the beginning of really understanding this evidence question and what it really means. So I think we've got a long way to go to reprofessionalize us, our, 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 our community in that way. But I think the prize is great. I think it's not only a prize for children, it's a prize for the profession yeah. that we can own this knowledge in a way or we can control it in a way that has been lost uh, and, and we're being pushed from pillar to post. So I think it's going to take time to get that language. I think the work you're doing to, to, to articulate a language and a framework is absolutely right. And that's what we're trying to do at home. But we're also trying to be really confident that as we construct uh, approaches to take that knowledge out, we are testing that in itself, running big trials on how do you communicate evidence? What do we know about this? Uh, and how can we verify that if we're going to, as I say, honor it across the a bit? Um, I think in terms of, you know, it's going to be an easy try answer whose job it is to uh, find great ideas. Of course, the, the easy answer is it's everybody's job. Uh, be, and it's everybody's job because it's everybody's job to take the success of our children seriously. And I guess... That, that I turn the question around is not whose job it is to find the great ideas, but um, if I'm saying everybody's, what we know is that most of the change that happens actually is controlled by a very small group of people. And that goes to my earlier point about power. Um, and if we want to really open this up so we have what we in England are talking about, disciplined innovation, where people are able to bring their ideas to the table knowing that that's going to be challenged and tested and you're going to be required to produce evidence that it works. You're not going to win it by popularity votes. There's no extra points for the innovative. The extra points come because what you've done works for our children. And so we need to get away from this glamorous view of school improvement and honor the hard grind that works. Kind of less nodding and more knowing, if you like, about the way we bring the change about. And then, and then, and then the, um, the, uh, Tony's point about RCTs. It's not that I'm kind of uh, sort of blinkered. Uh, it's just, uh, in a sense, it's pragmatic. It's about redressing a balance. Uh, we have enormous amount of qualitative research, which tells you an enormous amount of important information. But it seems to me that unless you've got the numbers and the story, mm. it's hard to make any sense of it. So in all of our studies, although we talk a lot about the RCT element, we also have a process study behind it. And we need to build both of those camps it's been very interesting in England that we've done quite a lot of work with the education community, the, 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 the academic community, in, having, in, in supporting growth in that sector of people who know how to do quantitative trials, of not always handing it over to the economics departments in a university, but actually build that skill set within our, within our educational research family where we've got lots of people who do lots of work. So it's a marrying of both. But we've really, you have to have the numbers, you have to have the, you know, the horse before the cart. And I want to see the impact before I really want to go delve down and work out the success features. It doesn't work. I don't really care. So it's, it's, it's bringing both, both, both to, bear, to bear. And then the, the emerging, I don't know, I'm, I'm tentative here, you know, the, the emerging opportunities. I, as I said, I think, they're, I think they're enormous, particularly for children, which is what matters to me most, particularly for disadvantaged children, which I still think is the great issue in education. And, and, and not only for the children, but also, and it's linked, obviously, to the professionalizing of teachers. I think it's a, a global issue, as you said earlier. I don't see any borders in evidence. I think it's, a, you know, in, in many ways, uh, especially between our two systems, there's enormous kind of similarities and points of contact and why we are, we, we use international research. Our toolkit is internationally based because evidence does transcend borders. So it's, it's an opportunity for us as educators to sit and really talk about uh, knowledge and really talk about things that work in our classrooms. And that seems to me to be uh, a great starting point to building um, a different kind of dialogue across the, across the education family. Fantastic, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you.